I mean, you use the GCU is set up such that you can measure all these temperatures in real time and run run pumps and whatnot to control your steam amount. So, I we were going to do it for this weekend. We didn't get it done. So it's it's not that big a deal. It's just technically it's not that big a deal. It just requires cycles to pay attention to. It. But until you had done your heat exchanger work, it wouldn't even be possible. Right. So this is so this is where we've got to for a very compact full heat exchange system. Oh wait, I didn't explain the last part of it. So the other critical part of this is the is is the the engine. The engine actually has about four times the amount of waste heat coming out of it as the the um, the gas coming out of the gas, I should say the exhaust, the exhaust gas coming out of the engine has about four times um, the heat potential or availability as the gas coming out of the gas fire. That's rather significant. That's our biggest waste heat source. Um, and it's also helpfully at a much higher temperature than what's coming out of the gas fire after you've dealt with your air preheating. Okay? It's coming out of the engine in the realm of 700 C. That's very valuable, that's a very valuable energy. It's not low grade energy. So um, the challenge in the architecture here is to line up various waste heats at certain temperatures with appropriate process points in the reactor. You can't take a 700C heat source and do your drying with it. You'll end up with pyrolysis uh, in a fire. Okay, so you don't want to take any waste heat and put it in, into you know, any, any process step. So this, the challenge in this is getting all these things layered correctly. So, but we use the 700C for pyrolysis. And 700C is a wonderful temperature as your feed source to pyrolysis. Okay, so the exhaust out of the engine in the toddy system is being used to run pyrolysis. We have a thing called pyrocoil, which is a double-walled vessel, similar, same basic design and building solution as the drawing vessel. We bring exhaust gas into here, circulates around the outside of the, the fuel, on the way into the reactor, and so such that we can fully poly pyrolysize the fuel and get it up to it seems about 500 C before it air enters into the area of the combustion. Okay, so instead of all of that pyrolysis happening you know, between 200 C and and you know the, the combustion temperatures of the base, instead of having that all be a parasitic load on combustion, we can run all of that externally off of the exhaust on the engine. Okay? So this returns us to the situation we had at an updraft, where the updraft, remember, we combusted and we progressively pulled the temperatures out and the combustion didn't have any drag from these other zones. Well, that's what we have here now. That the drying and the pyrolysis have been removed from a drag from combustion, though we can still pull the gas off after reduction and not send that gas itself back up through pyrolysis and drying. Okay. So this reestablishes the correct thermal relationships um, while still maintaining the, the, the better chemical relationships. Okay. The other big win you get here is not only removing the heat from pyrolysis, or that's required to run pyrolysis, but also the character of pyrolysis. Um, in a regular downdraft situation, because pyrolysis is happening passively on top of combustion, you get in the end, a very narrow little disc of pyrolysis here. It happens really in a, about an inch or two above the nozzles. It happens at a very high temperature in a very short period of time, which both of which are a problem. Um, the short period of time is a problem in that as you get larger and larger fuel, the time for pyrolysis increases. Um, biomass is fairly insulative, and once it's been charcoaled, it gets even more insulative. So the heat propagation through the material is rather slow. So you can end up in situations where you haven't fully finished the pyrolysis and you have the fuel already down past the nozzles and in the area you want to be reducing. Okay, so this is what happens when the fuel sizes get too big. So the time for pyrolysis and to get it fully completed before it's in the hearth is very important. And also the temperature in which it happens is important. Um, here when we were going through the basics of pyrolysis, the first gases that come off are literally fragments of the raw biomass. But as you increase the temperature in those gases um, from 200 C up to about a 700 C, you start to get recombination happening in those gases and they, 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 they go into different um, forms of tar. Okay? 
above 700 C, you're going to start cracking them back down again. You move into the cracking range. And we think, in general, you've got to get to 1,000. But the, the distinction in the different tar types is very important, both in biochar as well as trying to handle them in a gasifier. Tars are usually divided into three categories, primary, secondary, and tertiary. The primary ones are the raw fragments of the biomass. The secondary ones are once you've started to, to have those um, in a hot enough environment where they start to recombine, okay, and create a little more complicated forms. And the tertiary ones are higher temperature and further recombination in a manner that's characterized by lots of double carbon bonds, okay. As they form at higher and higher temperatures, they, they, get, they have more energy to form more, uh, more higher energy bonds, which in this case are double carbon bonds. Okay. That. What? That's bad. Right? That's bad because it's hard to get them back across or back back apart. So once you get these double carbon bonds, the things don't like to crack. Okay, so we also call these tertiary tars refractory tars. They're refractory and then they don't like to break. Okay, they also tend to be rather nasty. This is where you get the PAHs, the poly, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. So high temperature pyrolysis creates both a difficult to crack tar as well as a highly carcinogenic tar. Um, <laughs> Um, so you want to avoid that. But a downdraft in, its, in its, its typical form is optimized for the creation of exactly that. You have a very high temperature pyrolysis happening right on top of the nozzles. So pyrolysis is happening in an environment that is, that is in you know, 700 C to 1000 C sort of range. Okay? It goes all over again, it's a continuum. But you're, it's in the immediate proximity of those temperatures, so as, as immediately it comes out of the fuel, it's in this very high temperature environment, so you get immediate evolution of the tar gases into a tertiary form. So if you look at the, you analyze the tars that are coming out of an updraft unit versus a downdraft unit, they're completely different. An updraft, the pyrolysis is relatively cold or low temperature, so that you get primary, mostly primary tars and some secondary. In a downdraft, the pyrolysis is happening at incredibly high temperatures, so you get primarily the tertiary tars, a little bit of secondary, and almost zero of the, the raw primary tars. Okay? But if you start driving the pyrolysis with an external source, you can now control the temperature of the pyrolysis, which is what we're doing here. So we run pyrolysis at temperature that we get you know, primarily secondary, um, mostly the primary and secondary tar types, and we avoid the tertiary types. Okay, so by doing that, we create tar types that are much easier. Oh. So the primary and secondary ones are much easier to crack downstream because they don't have this double carbon bond. Okay, so you can relieve some of the, the difficulty of the tar cracking by making a better tar. We haven't fully characterized this yet. But, um, the next big big run of testing is going to be fully characterizing what this this drying bucket and pyrocoil does, which together make the tie. All the testing last year was, was formally characterizing the reactor. We've yet to go in and fully instrument the, the toddy system. Now, I know in principle what it does, and I can wave my hands and make PowerPoints about it, but we don't have any numbers on it yet. Okay? We have anecdotal reports, we stick things in and we look at it. We know it's doing what we wanted to do, but we don't have any numbers on it yet. Okay? Oh, could you explain again how you control the, the, uh, temperature the there? Is that by introducing water? No, it's by the, well, for, uh, fortunately, the engine has a temperature that we like already, okay? The engine was, the engines were very well conceived in relation to the temperatures you need for pyrolysis. So, we just use the exhaust. And we insulate it in a manner that, that gives us, or maintain, or gets it to the temperature we, we want to think. Oh, so you use now, so, yeah, but the problem is, like on, on a spark-fired engine, those, those gas temperature, exhaust temperatures are fairly consistent. Uh, diesel has a much wider range of, of exhaust gas temperatures because it's unthrottled and it's air all the time. So you only get the, you only get the high temperatures at a reasonable level. So it's cold like 600 C, that's the temperature something like that? Yeah, we're sending it in to, it's entering the thing at around 600 to 650 C, 700. So we're getting in the bed, and that's, that's what the heat exchange source is. So inside the bed, it's less than that. Um, and it appears that we're, we're getting the charcoal to about 500 C before it drops below the pyrocarbon. But again, we don't know that specifically. We just, it, it's clearly finishing pyrolysis. We know that very clearly. Um, you can see that. 
the actual temperature we're getting in there, we're, we're still figuring all that out. What's the So the exhaust leaving the pyrocoil is about 350C. So you can, it's still a temperature that you can use to do other things. So I mean, I might use that to, to raise the steam. That might be, well, everything else being equal, it would be easier than the cyclone. But I also want to cool the gas. Our gas is still hotter than we want it in the end. We have it, we have it about 40C usually at the engine. There's a little more we could get out there. That would be nice if we could. We don't necessarily need it. but So I'd rather take the, the heat out of the gas, the made gas, than the exhaust, because then I'm actually getting it two benefits. I've got this right. For the exhaust gas heat, you're extending your zone of pyrolysis, creating a zone that has a larger area, so the lower overall temperature, so you're getting easier to crack the primary cars rather than letting it all happen at once and creating pressure. That is correct. Okay. Can you turn a little bit more the heat exchange process? Are you actually directly ejecting the exhaust gas, or is there a heat exchange? No, there's a heat exchange surface. You can't put the exhaust gas in there, or else you're just gonna you're gonna fill your reactor with CO2 and water it. So the raw gases are not going in there. They're going through a, a, an annulus, a double walled vessel. Okay. Well, actually, here let's go. I didn't. I reordered these and didn't save it, so they've all gone. Okay, so this is what the pyrocoil looks like in its pieces. It's a double-walled annulus. <clears throat> Fuel's going down the center, and the exhaust gases are going around the outside. So here's your auger where the fuel comes in, passes down through here. Exhaust gas is coming in the side here. It wraps around the vessel, hits this baffle, goes downward, passes around the other side, comes back up and goes out. It's not a, it's not a particularly... Um, elaborate or mature um, path, um, since you know, it's only a partial pass over the central tube. But it's, it's enough to do what, what, what we want to do. Any percent of what the heating patterns are on that? Given especially the solar property? That's what we don't know yet. Is the CO2 really that effective of a reducing it? And if we were able to remove the water power to the temperature, would that effectively... I'm sorry, what was that again? I'm wondering how effective CO2 is in reducing it. Um, the resulting CO and hydrogen have about the same um, energy content, so you wouldn't choose one or the okay. one or the other over that. But in terms of the actual performance in the engine, the hydrogen is much more valuable because it has this very high flame front, a very fast flame front, so it compensates for the nitrogen. The CO has a good flame front, it's about the same as propane, but it, since you're trying to compensate for the nitrogen problem, You'd rather have the hydrogen. Yeah, I guess I'm saying instead of using a heat exchanger, if you were able to remove the water from both gases and then use that gas for other places, I think would that have a much more that value? So use use the exhaust gas out of the engine directly. Directly. If you could do that, I think. That's really well, smart. I've never thought of that. <laughs> you still have the nitrogen. Oh yeah, yeah. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. That's why. I, that's why I didn't do that. Sorry. Exhaust has a bunch of nitrogen in it. Yeah, you never had that. Okay. So yeah. So I mean, I I would rather be be in injecting the the steam, um, you know, minimizing the amount of combustion, um, and being able to con you know, actively work. <coughs> So it was wanting more. You, would, you would rather if you had if you had an um, if you had a free CO two source and a free water vapor source, you'd rather use the water because you're going to get you're going to get more um, hydrogen. So, but what I so the problem with the exhaust, yeah, it has nitrogen. Sorry, I forgot. So, if you make this thing just from the three fifty C leftover exhaust, oh yeah, and would that satisfy the constraints you're talking about? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I mean, I, what, how I imagine we do is. We, I've also considered raising it on the on the cyclone and then passing it through the exhaust on the way into the air intake. And being that we have, remember, we have we have way more capacity on the on the um, the air preheating system than we can actually actually use. I mean, both the heat exchange surface here is very 